All right, welcome to today's uh, Astro Particle Seminar. Everyone, this will be the last seminar of the year. The next one will be January 18. Uh, and today, uh, we're very happy to have Kenny. Uh, and uh, Kenny Ng, I, I never know how to pronounce your surname well, that's, Kenny. That's very, that's very close, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he will talk to us today, he's our speaker. If Kenny did his PhD at the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, CCAP at Ohio State, where we met. Uh, then he was a postdoc at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, and then he did a second uh, postdoc at, at Grappa at the University of Amsterdam. And now he, he recently started a position as assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, where he's now. Uh, Kenny has worked on a variety of, of, of topics involving uh, theory, uh, phenomenology, and experiment. And uh, some of them include the gamma ray emission from dark matter annihilation, uh, some, some topics in high energy astrophysical neutrinos long live mediators in the sun, uh, anti-helium in cosmic rays, um, and uh, many works uh, regarding dark matter in different, different ways, like star neutrino dark matter using Fermi gamma ray observations, dark matter velocity spectroscopy, Doppler effects in dark matter, uh, solar atmospheric neutrinos as a, as a floor for dark matter searches, uh, and a bunch of other very interesting topics. And today he'll talk to us about yet another avenue of research that he explores, and that is the unexpected features in the high energy gamma ray emission from the sun. And with that, I leave you with Kenny. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for this nice introduction. Uh, so hello, everyone. So good to see uh, you here. Uh, I hope everyone's safe. Okay, uh, please and stay home and be safe. Uh, yeah, so I always wanted to visit Newsport Institute. Uh, and unfortunately, last year when I was in Amsterdam, I, I sort of went into the lockdown mode soon after I got there and did not get to meet you and visit Copenhagen. Hopefully, I'll do, hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. Uh, so today, I will talk about gamma rays and neutrinos from the sun. Uh, it's a, a topic that I've been focusing on for the past few years. Okay, so it's not turning. All right, good. All right, so if you ask what is the most important astrophysical object uh, to humankind, it's probably the sun. So there are many important aspects. For example, right, we got all our, almost all our energies, including our food energy uh, from the sun. Uh, in terms of the, in the modern society, right, in, if we consider the short-term effects, uh, the sun has an 11-year cycle where it becomes more active and it becomes less active. And it is known that uh, sometimes when the sun becomes active, right, it can create solar storms uh, that can directly affect the uh, uh, electrical systems on Earth. In the longer term, it is also unclear whether the sun can induce uh, climate effects uh, due to the evolution of the sun itself. So both of these are strong motivations for us to continue to improve our understandings of the sun. But for physicists, we're interested in doing physics. Right? So at some point, the sun was actually a also a very uh, useful target for studying fundamental physics. For example, back in the 18th somethings, okay, so astronomers, when they look at the sun, turns out they find a emission line okay, uh, from the chromosphere of the sun uh, from an element that has never been identified on Earth. Okay? Uh, so they named that element helium. So helium was actually first discovered from observations of the sun before it was isolated on Earth. Okay. And back in the 18 somethings, the discovery of a new element can certainly be classified as fundamental physics. More recently, okay, uh, the most important uh, understandings on physics coming from the sun is probably detection of solar neutrinos. The detection itself tells us that, tell us that how the energy generation process works from stars. Okay? And more than, uh, and moreover, from the neutrin comparis comparing between the detected neutrinos and our models on how these neutrinos are created, we have now uh, understood that uh, neutrinos has mass. Okay? So neutrinos actually has to change flavors when they propagate. Okay? So, and this, that's these people the Nobel Prize uh, in physics, I think it's 2015. Yeah. And so throughout these years, we have learned uh, 
many things, okay, from different observations at different wavelengths from the sun. Okay, so the latest one is probably uh, at MEV neutrinos uh, from the sun. So it sort of sits into here. And then we have also UV radios and X-rays, each revealing a different aspect. I'm not, uh, so I won't have time to go into these. So the focus on today is even higher energies at GE. Okay? So MEV is already the core temperature of the sun. Okay, so you should ask why we expect to see anything at GEV uh, uh, from the sun. The answer is that it's not coming from the sun itself. Okay? It comes from cosmic rays. So cosmic rays exist, okay? and the sun sitting there, it's just like a ball of gas. Okay? So high energy cosmic rays, when they meet the sun, the sun in that case will become just like a beam dump. Right? Interactions can happen, and then they can produce uh, secondary particles. Because of the wide energy range of cosmic rays, so you expect all energy, can, uh, can, all energy secondaries can be possible. Okay. So the sun is, you can consider it, it's just like a cosmic ray beam dump. There are two main reactions that is interesting. One is cosmic ray electrons can inverse Compton uh, with the sunlight. So the low energy sunlight and upscatter it into gamma rays. Okay. The other process is hadronic interactions. Cosmic rays, mostly protons, can directly interact with the protons in the solar atmosphere. And we know hadronic interactions can produce neutrinos and gamma rays. So today I will only focus on hadronic interactions. Okay? And through these PPU interactions, gamma rays are produced by the usual way for neutral pion decays. Okay? And neutrinos can be produced from decays of pions and muons. Okay? So all these are messengers, including maybe electrons and positrons, sometimes maybe neutrons, okay? are, are potentially detectable uh, if we have the right detector. Okay. So my personal interest on this problem was actually coming from another angle. It's on the problem of dark matter. Okay. So from observations from the largest cosmological scales from, uh, from CMB and BBN down to the galactic scales, okay, we have very strong evidence that uh, the known matter cannot explain all the gravitational phenomena. So uh, the universe probably exists probably exists some additional form of matter that does not have uh, normal known standard model interactions. So one of the most uh, well-motivated dark matter candidates to explain these missing matter is the weakly interacting massive particles. Okay. Uh, in short summary, it's just a particle that can interact with this way. Okay. So if it move, if you look at this direction, that means dark matters can annihilate into standard model particles. Or if you look at these directions, standard model particles can uh, interact with each other and produce dark matter. Or if you look at on sideways, okay, so a dark matter can come in and interact with a standard model particles and leave as we call we call it standard model particles. This is how, for example, direct detections aims to detect dark matter. So the way the sun interacts enters this picture is that. It's just like a ball of gas sitting there. Okay? So dark matter flies through everywhere. So occasionally a dark matter can come through, interact. Okay? Normally this dark matter is not gravitationally bound, but after it hits something from the sun, okay, it can lose a little bit of energy and be gravitationally bound to the sun. Okay? Then it will continues to orbit okay, and continues to interact and lose energy eventually a dark population of dark matter will build up at the centers of the sun uh, as it continues to lose energy. Once this happens, okay, then reactions from this way can happen. Right? Once you have a large population of dark matter, they can start to annihilate in a appreciable rate. Uh, the annihilation of dark matter from the center of the sun, the only thing that can escape uh, that we may detect is neutrinos. Okay? And the energy and the spectrum information of these neutrinos, if we detect it, we could potentially uh, infer the properties of the dark matter itself. Okay. So I was mainly interested in this problem several years ago. Okay. And back then, okay, so the observations of these neutrinos, so these neutrinos, uh, depending on the mass of dark matter, could be TeV and hundreds of GeV, okay, have never been observed. Okay. And, but we do have detectors that try to see them. 
So for example, super K and ice cube, this is the limit they were able to set on the scattering cross sections between dark matter and protons. And they, depending on the channel, they were the most sensitive ways to detect these interactions. Okay, so neutrino telescopes and also these high energy neutrinos from the sun is a very sensitive way to uh, uh, constrain dark matter properties or maybe even detect dark matter. Okay. So the problem was this, right? We want to detect neutrinos coming from dark matter annihilating in the core of the sun. And the dark matter that we're interested in, a lot of times they have energies, uh, they have mass between GeV to TeV. Okay. And we know that there's non-standard model uh, process that can also produce these kind of neutrinos, uh, neutrinos at GeV to TeV. Okay, from cosmic ray protons interacting with the sun. So to help us to detect our matter, we need to understand the background process, right? hey, these neutrinos. Okay? And because none of these neutrinos has been observed yet, okay? so we look at the next easy detectable messengers, which, is, which are the gamma rays, produced from the same process. Right? If we understand gamma rays, we understand these neutrinos, which may allow us to eliminate it as a background. So that was when I got into a rabbit hole uh, in trying to understand this whole thing. Okay. So today I will talk about uh, a lot about the gamma rays from these cosmic rays interacting with the sun. Okay. So before we do that, first look at some simple limits. Okay. Uh, the sun, okay, if I ignore its magnetic fields, we, do, we can really consider it just a ball of gas. Okay, so ignoring magnetic fields, if you think about it, the only way you can see uh, gamma rays produced by cosmic ray interactions, it's from cosmic rays uh, that approaches from very near the edge of the atmosphere. Okay? You have to be close enough such that you see enough matter to have one interaction, okay? Uh, but you cannot be too deep into the atmosphere, otherwise the produced gamma rays cannot escape. So we call this the solar limb contribution. Okay? And this, it, we expect this to happen when you can ignore magnetic fields. That means uh, uh, if you consider very, very high energy protons or very, very high energy cosmic rays. Okay? So you can estimate how much gamma rays uh, are produced through these limb contributions. Okay? Roughly, uh, cosmic rays can convert 0.1% of its energy density okay? uh, through these gamma. Uh, into these gamma rays. The rest of them would be a salt, okay, if we ignore magnetic fields. Okay. So conversely, okay, if we count uh, these gamma rays that could be absorbed, okay, this would be correspond to a 100% conversion rate uh, for the cosmic ray energy into gamma rays. Okay. This it turns out it's a very useful benchmark and we'll see that later. Uh, we'll call this the theoretical maximum from the cosmic ray uh, uh, interacting with the sun, the theoretical maximum output of the gamma rays. So these two scenarios are the cases when we ignore magnetic fields. Unfortunately, real life is that the sun do have magnetic fields and it's quite complicated. What you expect magnetic fields to do is that it, of course, will bend the trajectories of the charged cosmic rays when they go through near the sun, okay? So now it does not travel in straight lines, okay? So you can imagine that means there are more possibilities to produce observable gamma rays. Okay? So normally a cosmic rays, for example, entering in this direction, normally this will never produce a gamma rays that point at Earth. Okay? But because of magnetic fields, it could spiral around and eventually interact and produce a gamma rays that point at Earth. Okay? So back in the 90s, okay, before any of these gamma rays were actually uh, observed, um, these people, Seko, Stenef, and Geyser, uh, they thought about this problem and they estimated that about 1%, okay, maybe 1% of the cosmic rays, once we include the magnetic fields, uh, can be converted into detectable gamma rays. Okay. So what they really considered is that the sun's magnetic fields okay, in small scales can be considered as a lot of small scale uh, magnetic flux tubes that sits between these uh, convection cells on the surface of the sun. Okay. So 
what they really consider is that assuming cosmic rays, uh, when it's above, way above the atmosphere, follows the magnetic field lines. All of these magnetic field lines will eventually enter, uh, merge into these magnetic flux tubes. So charged particles will follow the field lines, and then they enter these flux tubes. And from our classical electrodynamics, we know that charged particles entering a region of large field gradients will be reflected. So that's the process they consider. And uh, of course, they use very simple, uh, simplified assumptions. But the basic idea is that if you can reflect these cosmic rays, okay, some of them will interact while they, after they uh, are reflected. And this boosts your gamma ray production. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So uh, this sets up the framework for most of today's discussion. So that's the energy flux versus the energy of the gamma rays from the sun. Okay. So I put here the 100% cosmic ray energy conversion efficiency. So the cosmic ray upper bound. This was the Seiko Stenif and Geiser model uh, back in 1990s. Okay. So this corresponds to about 1% conversion efficiency from the cosmic ray energy. So now let's talk about detections. Uh, detections of these solar gamma rays is really possible only after the launch of Fermi back in, uh, in 2008. Okay. So uh, I'm not going into detail on how this uh, data analysis is done. Okay. The short description is that the sun is, as a gamma ray source, it actually moves on the sky. Okay. So you just need to follow it and then continuously take pictures and then stack all the pictures together you will get a picture of the sun. Okay. Now, because everything else moves while you're checking on the sun, you can sort of uh, eliminate them. Okay. So this is a picture of the sun above 10 GeV. Okay. So you can pretty sure you can, hopefully I can convince you the sun exists above 10 GeV. You can clearly see there's a collection of photons here. Okay. So you subtract all uh, the backgrounds coming from everything else, as well as from the uh, cosmic ray electron interacting with the sunlight. Okay, so the inverse Compton process. You can subtract them, then whatever that's left comes from the disk of the sun itself. So that was more or less what was first done. Uh, the first study of solar gamma rays in the Fermi area was by the Fermi team. Okay, so this is the paper. This was what they measured. Okay, so from uh, uh, 0.1 GeV to about uh, to 10 GeV. So this was what got us interested in this problem. First, uh, first we would notice is that it's very high. Okay? So it's even higher than this uh, uh, SSG model. And remember, this model is already a booster prediction. Okay? So they already claim that magnetic fields can boost the gamma ray production. Turns out the detection data is even higher. Okay? So something, uh, so that means, if it's magnetic fields, magnetic fields are more efficient than what uh, they expected, okay? And looking at the spectral shape, okay, so maybe it's a little bit difficult to see at this point, but it doesn't seem uh, quite like this prediction, okay? So we got interested in this problem and we did our own data analysis. So this was a result from our 2018 paper where we have used nine years of Fermi data, okay? So this is the total nine years averaged uh, Sobola gamma ray spectrum. Looking at this, okay, you should immediately have some question marks. Okay. So the first one is probably at lower energies. Okay. Uh, we see a different spectrum, uh, at least at around one GV compared to the Fermi data. And when we look at this, turns out that we find uh, this can be explained okay, if we consider the time evolution of these gamma ray flux at these energies. So it turns out if we look at the gamma ray flux, for example, in this plot is the gamma ray flux between one and three GB as a function of the years. Okay, so we look at nine years. The gamma ray flux at this energy range changes. Okay, so from 2008, uh, it was very high and then it decreases. It reached sort of a minimum at around 2014 and then it rises again. Okay, so this trend, uh, if we, can be understood if we also plot the uh, average sunspot number okay, of the sun, which is this dashed line. So the sunspot number chases sort of the activities of the sun. Okay? When there's more sunspots, the sun was considered at an active state. Okay? 
So there is an anti-correlation between the solar gamma ray flux versus the solar activity. Okay. So this trend itself is not surprising because from cosmic ray studies on Earth, we know that when the sun becomes more active, less cosmic rays can get to the uh, position of the Earth. So that's probably also true, right? When the sun becomes more active, less cosmic rays can get into the atmosphere of the sun and interact. Okay. But what's surprising is the amplitude of uh, this effect. Okay. So if you look at here, the flux drops by a factor of three. And this is for 100, uh, one GV gamma rays. Okay. So that means you, uh, the progenitor cosmic rays uh, that's responsible for the production of these gamma rays, it's about 10 GV. We've never seen such a large uh, modulation amplitude at these energies before. Okay. So there's no quantitative explanation for this effect. So that also, once we know that, note to that, that the gamma ray flux depends on time. Okay, So it sort of motivates us to do another analysis, which is to look at the solar gamma ray flux only when the sun is at its minimum uh, state. So when the sun is not active, okay? because then uh, once we have this compared with the Fermi data, we agree uh, at these energies, okay? because we are sort of uh, both looking at the same similar time period, both when the sun was not active. So the flux is about a bit higher. But now when we look at the full spectrum, okay, uh, we find another interesting feature if we focus on the highest energy above 10, 100 GV. Okay? So the flux seems to be enhanced uh, by a lot compared to the nine years averaged. And when we look at the data more carefully, turns out we find a very surprising trend. If we only look at the photon events above 100 GeV, we find that there are six events between August 2008 and January uh, 2010, when the sun was quiet. And this was about 1.5 years, okay, out of all the nine years. And we find zero events for the rest of our analysis period. Okay. So just visually guide you. So this is the sun average sunspot number, okay, as a function of years. We see six photons in here, and then zero for the rest of this period. Okay. So what it means is probably that for some reason, the production of these most energetic uh, solar gamma rays that we have ever detected is extremely sensitive. Okay, so it's even more sensitive than the lower energy photons. Uh, extremely sensitive to the activity of the sun. Okay, and that is still not clear why. All right, now uh, another surprise is that now we have a spectrum combining uh, the Fermi data and our analysis. Uh, it spans from uh, 100 MeV to a little bit above 100 GeV. Okay. Looking at this spectrum uh, on average, okay, uh, there is a surprising effect okay, because this spectrum is quite flat. It's about e to the minus 2.2. Now we know that uh, these gamma rays okay, comes from cosmic ray interactions. Okay. So we can parameterize this effect. We know that the cross-section of pre-P cross-section is roughly energy independent. The input cosmic ray spectrum is e to the minus 2.7. Okay. The only thing we don't know is how magnetic field changes these gamma ray production. If we parameterize this as an efficiency factor, okay, that means this efficiency factor that encapsulates the effect of the magnetic fields on the production of these gamma rays has to increase with energy with a roughly a positive uh, 0 0.05 power. Okay. This should be surprising, right? Because if it's the effect of magnetic fields, you would expect the effect of magnetic fields decreases with energy. Okay. Uh, so the fact that this is positive should be quite surprising. And also, if you look at the flux we see doing solar minimum at the highest energy end, it's quite already quite close to the cosmic ray upper bound. So for some reason, the efficiency here it's approaching our uh, order unity. Okay, so it's about a few tenths of percent. Okay, so and why this efficiency is increasing in energy and it can reach so high? It's still unknown. Okay, so uh, the final uh, surprise, which you should 
immediately notice when you look at this spectrum is that there is a spectral dip between 30 and 50 G. So this spectral dip is actually uh, very difficult to explain from normal astrophysics uh, modeling. And also it's the most strongest when we uh, filter out the uh, solar minimum data. Okay. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you really whether this feature is real or not. Okay. So we've, ex we've done a lot of systematic chats. We also talked to the Fermi people and we uh, cannot identify any systematic issues. Okay. Um, but uh, 2008 is also when Fermi was just launched. Okay. So maybe there is some problems with the Fermi detector right after it's launched. Okay. Nobody knows. Okay. Uh, the, so the real cause of these features, if it's real, it's very difficult to explain. If it's something wrong with the detector, it has not been identified yet. Okay. So it's still a mystery. So that's, okay. Uh, so that's uh, at least the current status of this thing. Now, the final thing uh, that we can do with solar gamma rays okay, is that uh, the energy, sorry, the angular resolution of Fermi actually improves with energy. Okay? So one thing we notice is that above 10 GeV, okay, the PSF, the point spread function of these detector photons actually becomes smaller than the physical size of the sun. So this, uh, black solid line is the actual physical uh, size of the sun in the optical wavelength. Okay? So if you look at the sun, the sun is like this big. Now, if you, uh, selecting these photons, we can chase this, we can put uh, the arrival directions on the surface of the sun. Okay? And turns out that the, these distributions has a non-trivial distribution. Okay? So these are the 10 to 50 GVs. Okay, uh, coming from the sun during the solar uh, minimum period. And then on the right hand side, these are also the 10 to 50 GV photons, uh, but that's from 2010 to roughly 2018. Okay. So the left hand side distribution, uh, if we look at it, it's roughly consistent with a isotropic distribution from this sphere. Okay. But if we consider when the sun was more active, and you look at the distribution of these photons, you may even be able to see a little bit is that there's a deficit of the photons coming from the equator area. Okay? So the sun is actually spinning, uh, rotating okay, uh, in this direction when we look at it. So the, along the equator area, okay, somehow there's a deficit of photons in these energies. The effect is even stronger if we look at the high energy events. So same plots, but for about 50 GeV. When the sun was active, uh, sorry, when the sun was not active before 2000, uh, between 2008 and 2010, turns out most of the photons actually come from the equator area. But if we move to the other periods, there's a strong deficit of photons coming from the equator. Okay, so this probably if, uh, reflects Okay, some of the how magnetic fields actually affected the production of these photons, but exactly how, like what kind of features is responsible for this, we don't know. Okay, and we're still trying to figure it out. And I was suggested to have a break sort of in between. Okay, so maybe I can have a quick summary on some of the things we find using Fermi. Okay. So there is a bit of a solar gamma ray plus puzzle. Okay, if these gamma rays are produced by uh, cosmic rays interacting with the sun, the flux is, is quite high, especially during solar min minimum. Okay. The spectrum is harder than the cosmic ray spectrum. Okay. Uh, and we find that the flux level has different kinds of anti-correlation with solar activity. Okay. So the anti-correlation is expected, but the amplitude uh, can, uh, have, cannot be explained yet. And there's a non-trivial morphology that also changes with time. And all of these have no quantitative explanations yet. So uh, any questions so far on these uh, gamma ray observations? I'd be happy to uh, discuss with you. So I have one, can you, in the, in yes. the pattern where there is a, the minimum for the uh, gamma rays that uh, uh, you cannot explain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, is there anything else that uh, can actually sort this out, like any other, uh, I don't know, survey that they can look in that specific region? 
Right. So if this feature is real, okay, uh, and if it's really associated with solar minimums, okay, so the easiest way is that uh, we wait another 11 years and see the sun again, right? So actually, uh, that's sort of be, uh, being done uh, uh, that I'm not involved, but by the OSU group. Okay, so uh, they, uh, together with Tim, Tim Linden, uh, they're working on an updated analysis on this. Okay, uh, but the problem is that Fermi had an accident, I think last year or two years ago, whether it limits its uh, ability to point. Okay, so that somehow makes the sun uh, spends way less time on the field of view of Fermi. Okay. So the statistics that can be gathered with Fermi from the current solar minimum is much less than the last time. Okay. So from what I've heard is that uh, it cannot really allow us to make any definitive statements. Other than Fermi, there's no really good uh, gamma ray telescopes at this energy range. They can answer this question, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. So Kenny, I have another question. So if you look now at your blue curve, that's the average over several years, right? Yeah. Uh, can you do something like that, but not with Fermi, but with uh, Hawk, for instance, and see if it matches? Yeah, so very good. So Hawk can see the sun, uh, but the, Hawk, the lower energy range of Hawk is a few hundred GB. Okay. So Hawk okay. starts in here. So if Hawks see something, it will be in here. I see. Okay. And we are, we are getting there. Yes. <laughs> OK. Yeah. All right. Then to, OK, then I guess I'll move on. And thanks, Mauricio. He's asking a very prompt question. Okay. So if you look at this spectrum, OK, especially the one for solar minimum, there's no obvious cut off. Right? The obvious thing you ask is, can the sun even goes into a very high energy at TV range? So at TV range, uh, we have very good gamma ray detectors. Okay? In the near future, we have CTA. But for obvious C reasons, CTA cannot look at the sun. Okay? So the only gamma ray detector at high, very high energy range that can look at the sun are the ground-based air shower detectors. Okay? So Hawk is one of them. So it's a collection of water tanks. If there is a gamma ray shower, gamma ray induced air shower, you detect all these things and then you reconstruct the gamma rays. Okay. So in the near future, there's another gamma ray telescope uh, that's currently under construction. Uh, my understanding is 75% complete in Southwest China, called LASO. Okay. So LASO has two components. Okay, so it's, there is a sparse array and then there's a dense array. The dense array is basically like Hawk, but it's four times bigger. So there's a four times of Hawk collective, uh, collecting areas in here. So once LASO is completed, uh, so it's already taking data. And if you see in archive, they even have some papers, I think. But once LASO is completed, it will be uh, even better than Hawk in terms of detecting uh, gamma rays at this energy range. Um, so this is a fun game. If you go to Hawk's website and you can ask if you can differentiate whether this is a gamma ray shower or a proton shower. And I forgot the answer. So you can go to that website and try. So uh, we also got Hawk interested in this problem. Uh, so we together, we uh, used 2014 to 2017's uh, Hawk data. And this was a period when the sun was quite active, okay? So if you remember the gamma ray spectrum, when the sun was active, the gamma ray flux at very high energy is low, okay? So we do not expect to produce any detections for this period, okay? But it's, it's still a very interesting exercise to us to demonstrate the capability of Hawk, okay? So uh, normally for Hawk, okay, with all their data, including normal cosmic rays, towards the direction of the sun, they actually see a shadow, okay? Because the cosmic rays are blocked by the actual sun itself, okay? The way to remove all the cosmic ray contaminations is to apply a gamma hadron cut, okay? Based on the morphologies of the showers that the detectors can see. So for these periods of data, after the gamma hadron separation, 
Hawk do not see anything towards the position of the sun. So for reference, if the sun is emitting at maximum cosmic ray efficiency, this is what they are expected to see. So the fact that Hawk is not seeing anything, that means we can constrain the flux at a level below the uh, cosmic ray measure, uh, maximum. So uh, for 2014, 2017, using the Hawk observations, this is the upper limits we obtain. Okay? So, uh, if the gamma ray flux sort of follows this blue region, okay, the upper limit is not really constraining. But that also means we can, if the gamma ray is extending, okay, sort of in this region, then with Hawk, uh, we may be able to see it. Okay, so um, we know that the sun enters another minimum starting in 2018. Okay, so actually right now at the end of 2020, the sun is starting to leave the minimum phase. So uh, maybe Hawk can detect the sun at very high energy range. Okay. Uh, it was quite exciting because in last year, 2019's ICRC, okay, so Hawk actually presented a preliminary result from the 2018 data. So that's the new set of data that we, uh, uh, we did not use. And this is the events, okay, uh, access, okay, center at the position of the sun. Okay, so zero, this is the position of the sun. Okay, so this is from 2018. Now, I was excited to see this plot because uh, if you look at what happens in 2015 to, to 2017, 2015, if you look at the same plot, this is a deficit. Okay. This deficit comes from a incomplete elimination of the cosmic ray background, right? Because the cosmic rays blocked by the sun actually produce a shadow, a deficit. So if you do not eliminate this perfectly, you see a deficit. Okay. Now in 2015 to 2017, it's always hovering around zero. But in 2018, okay, there seems to be a hint of a positive axis. Okay. So maybe uh, the sun is becoming brighter at TV. Okay. So maybe Hawk can, uh, if they, also look at 2019 and 2020. So the analysis is underway. Maybe combined, we can see something. That would be very interesting. Okay. So if that's the case, that's great. Okay. So that makes a sun a TV source. That would be quite exciting. So that is sort of the summary uh, on uh, the situation on the gamma ray observations uh, up to 2019. Uh, our, my original hope is to use it to understand the neutrino production, right? Turns out the gamma rays are quite complicated. Okay, much of it cannot be explained. Uh, so that hope was, uh, uh, was too good to be true. Uh, but on, on the other hand, all these things implies that maybe gamma rays can be a new uh, tool to understand the sun. Certainly on how the uh, cosmic ray dynamics or charged particle dynamics near the surface of the sun. So maybe it can be do something interesting there. Now, okay, so let's talk, move on to talk about neutrinos, okay, our original motivation. So I will give you a quick overview on the current status on uh, theory and observations on this. So for many, many years, okay, uh, so before that, okay. So the calculation of solar atmospheric neutrinos is very similar, very similar to how Earth atmospheric neutrinos are produced. Right? So you have charged particles entering the atmosphere. You have some air showers, you produce neutrinos, okay? and you just count all these neutrinos. So for many years, people uh, also try to calculate this problem from the sun. Uh, so the latest calculations are done by Joachim and uh, Carlos okay, in 2017. So these calculations ignore magnetic fields. So none of them consider magnetic fields. That means the Cosmic rays travels in straight line. So if you enter here, you produce a neutrino that has to pass through the sun and then reach the earth. Okay. So this problem is somewhat tractable okay, and it has been done. Uh, no, change to detail. So if you look at these, uh, these kind of predictions, okay, and comparing from the same solar uh, angle, they are higher than the earth atmospheric neutrino predictions. So they are higher because at where the cosmic ray interacts, the solar atmosphere is comparatively dilute, uh, 
comparing the same thing that happens on Earth. A more dilute atmosphere allows the pions and the kaons to more readily decay than we interact. Okay? So that favors the production of these neutrinos. So that means from the same solar angle, uh, the solar atmospheric neutrinos is above the Earth atmospheric neutrino background, right? if you want to detect these neutrinos. And unfortunately, to detect these neutrinos, the best uh, uh, flavor we could want is muons because it has good angular resolutions. But at around TV neutrino energies, the outgoing muon has a scattering angle with the incoming neutrinos that cannot be escaped. Okay, so it's about one degree. So that makes the Earth atmospheric neutrino shoots up. Okay, once you go to low energies, so only above maybe. Uh, a few, ten, a few TV to almost 10 TV, the solar atmospheric neutrino can be higher than the Earth atmospheric background. Okay. So this is what it looks like for the neutrino flux. Okay. And you know that's, you notice that's only above TV uh, is in, interesting for detection of these neutrinos. That means we have to go to ice cube. Okay. Uh, only ice cube is large enough. And in the future, maybe also KM3 nets. So the question is that for these solar atmospheric neutrino induced muon events, okay, which is being shown in here, okay, uh, it, is, it has two phases. Okay. If you were interested in the dark matter problem, these solar atmospheric neutrinos together with the earth atmospheric neutrinos, these are background events, right? because you want to detect dark matter. You don't want to see any of these. But on the other hand, right, if you are interested in just detecting this as a new source of neutrinos, okay, then the solar atmospheric neutrinos is also a signal. Uh, and the only way to detect it is to go a bit higher in energies once the atmospheric neutrino background drops down. Okay. So it has two phases. Okay. So if you're interested in the dark matter problem, there's an immediate consequence uh, for dark matter studies. So dark matter neutrinos coming from the sun because it has to leave the core of the sun. So they cannot be, uh, they will never be too energetic. Okay? If they're too energetic, they will not uh, be able to leave from the core of the sun. So for dark matter studies, okay, the events below TV is the interesting uh, energy range. Okay? And there is a problem uh, because these solar atmospheric neutrinos they also comes from directly from the direction of the sun. Okay, compared to Earth atmospheric neutrino, where it is truly diffuse. That means, in terms of a detector that was trying to detect uh, neutrinos from the direction of the sun, these solar atmospheric neutrinos uh, they look just like the dark matter. Okay? Uh, while the Earth atmospheric neutrino background, it can uh, potentially uh, be able to beat down okay, if you have more statistics or better analysis method. Okay, so the problem is that once you have a detector, neutrino detector that reaches the sensitivity to detect these solar atmospheric neutrinos, you will never be able to tell them apart if a dark matter signal hides below this solar atmospheric background. Okay. So this actually defines in the dark matter parameter space, a region that uh, a neutrino test group cannot probe. Okay. Because if the dark matter lives in here, they are overwhelmed by the solar atmospheric background. Okay. So there is a solar atmospheric neutrino floor for using dark matter to, sorry, for using uh, solar uh, high energy neutrinos from the sun to detect dark matter. So that's the thing that we point out together with these people. Okay. Now as a signal, okay, whether you can see these solar atmospheric neutrino events depends on whether the neutrino telescopes can separate these events right, uh, from low energy to high energy. If neutrino test groups cannot differentiate these events, let's say above 100 GeV, you can see from this plot that the Earth atmospheric neutrino dominates, okay? So it becomes very difficult to isolate these events. The only way possible is to have some energy information on these in, uh, so neutrino induced muon events, okay? So the latest study was done by IceCube. So, uh, last year, okay. Uh, so they used seven years of the data, okay. Uh, and this is their current uh, sensitivity, 
Okay, so it's about uh, 20 times higher than the benchmark flux. And, but this flux was, uh, again, computed with our magnetic fields. Okay. So sim sites to detect these neutrinos, okay, uh, it's quite difficult, okay. most likely because they cannot really uh, eliminate these low energy backgrounds. Okay. Uh, I was told that they are trying to experiment with some machine learning methods to try to better uh, reconstruct the energy obtain more energy information from these muons. Maybe if that's possible, uh, they can improve the analysis. Okay, so I don't, but I don't really know. And All right, so I then, then I yes. Ask, is a super kamiokande also uh, sensitive to this uh, signal? Yeah, so, so super K is too small. Uh, in terms of raw event rates, it's just uh, too small to be uh, sensitive. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, so then uh, comes in 2020. So uh, here I will talk about the current status on understanding this problem. Okay. Uh, so this year there are two papers. So I, I was involved in this one. Uh, we tried to, we both tried to simulate cosmic rays interacting with the sun. Okay, so we move on from semi analytic models. We just set up a ball of gas. Uh, importantly, we also put in magnetic fields, and then we just should cause uh, charge particles in and see what comes out. So, uh, in these, in both scenarios, we use a sort of a simple, simple but uh, reasonable solar atmospheric uh, solar magnetic field model. It's called the potential field source surface model. So, really, it's just uh, based on the photosphere observation. So, magnetic field measurements on the surface area, on the surface of the sun, and sort of use some assumptions to extrapolate out to the uh, space regions above the uh, photosphere, okay? Uh, these kind of models, it's not super accurate, but it's known to be reasonable. So I will start talking about what they did, okay? So the uh, Maciota et al. Okay? So they used, uh, Fluka, which is a particle simulation code to simulate these interactions. Okay? Uh, and just to note these authors, uh, some of them, at least some of them are the authors of the Fluka code. So there's two main interesting effects they consider. One is the cosmic ray propagation in, uh, inside the solar system. So not just from interstellar space to earth, but also from earth to the sun. Okay? Then they put in the uh, PFSS magnetic fields that I just mentioned. So the effect of cosmic ray propagation, at least what they found, is that it only it's only gets important for uh, energies below uh, a few G. Okay. All right. So this is the result. Okay, the gamma ray prediction okay. uh, after you sim uh, after using the cosmic rays and with the PFSS magnetic fields. These are the gamma ray spectrum they expect to come out of the sun. So let's break down uh, the, main res uh, the results. Okay. So this is uh, their prediction, a control when they uh, deactivate magnetic fields. So B equal to zero. Okay. Um, so this is the case they get when they assume a magnetic field strength uh, at 10% uh, level, okay. just another control. And this is their uh, sort of the benchmark predictions Okay, and this is the benchmark prediction plus a enhancement in magnetic fields using um, another magnetic field model called Bifrost. What this does is that it enhances in, addi in addition, it enhances the magnetic fields by 25 times uh, once it's very close to the surface of the sun. Okay, all right, so let's understand what's happening and let's only focus on these two plots. One thing interesting is that at B equal to zero, if you, if you look at the gamma ray predictions, uh, just below one GV, it gets very high, okay? So it turns out with our magnetic fields, there is a way to enhance the production of gamma rays, which is close to the observation levels, okay? Uh, and I will actually just talk about what happens in here uh, later. Okay. Now with magnetic fields, this is what they see, okay? Um, so with magnetic fields, the low energy range below one GV, it's a bit, a little bit less, okay, but it's still close to the observation level. But at 10 GV, it's enhanced, okay. Uh, 
but you should note that even if it's enhanced, it's enhanced by these uh, PFS magnetic fields, it's still not close anywhere near the observation level. Okay. Uh, so that means PFS magnetic fields, if the calculation is correct, cannot explain these gamma wave flux. Now they try to and uh, put in more magnetic fields with this bifrost models, and you can see that's the effect. Okay, so the high energy flux is further enhanced. Now it seems to be get much closer, okay, to the data. Okay, but I will show you because this data they're comparing is the nine years averaged. If you put in the solar minimum flux here, it's still uh, way higher than their prediction. Okay, so that was sort of the main result by that. Okay, and the conclusion uh, you should get away is that turns out GV level flux uh, can be enhanced without any magnetic fields. Okay, so there is an effect that has never been considered uh, that enhances magnetic fields, uh, and magnetic fields could enhance the gamma ray production flux at 10 GV, around 10 GV and above, okay? So this is the paper that we did, okay? Um, unfortunately, we got scooped by them. Uh, our, sim our study is very simple, okay? So we only consider cosmic uh, protons and we do not do any uh, um, cosmic propagation, okay? Uh, but cosmic propagation is only matters for low energies as they show. We also consider PFS as magnetic fields, okay? And specifically, we consider these regions around the photosphere. That's where we expect the interactions uh, to be happened, okay? So this is our results with our magnetic fields, okay? And this is our results with magnetic fields from two different periods, okay? So during when the sun was quiet and when the sun was active. Now you will see that with our magnetic fields, comparing to uh, this paper, Joe et al., that was uh, a semi-analytic calculation with a magnetic fuse. There is a bump here, okay? That was the same bump as this one, okay? Now to understand what happens here, what we did is to we look at the angular distributions between the incoming protons and the outgoing gamma rays, okay? Now, if, no, if there's no magnetic fields, Okay. Normally, you would expect the direction of the outgoing gamma rays should be uh, the same direction as the incoming protons, right? That means this angle should be very close to zero. So that means this cosine of this angle it should be peaks to one. Okay. So for no magnetic field case, which is this green dashed line, we indeed find that is the case okay, if we look at very high energy proton events. Okay. So above 10, 100 GeV, the angle between the gamma rays and the protons, it's very small. Okay. Uh, but turns out at low energies, okay, between 100 MeV to even 10 GeV incoming protons, there is a non-negligible scattering angle between the incoming proton and the outgoing gamma ray, okay, even with a magnetic field. And we think this is caused because of the, uh, uh, just because of the kinematics. Okay. So a roughly near uh, not very relativistic protons scattering with a proton, the gamma rays has to follow right where the pion produce, right? Or if it's secondary, it follows where the electron uh, Bremsstrahlung take place. Okay. If the energy is low, just due to particle kinematics, it can go, uh, it may not necessarily follow the incoming protons. And we think that this broad distribution is what enhances the gamma ray production. Now this is the green line is the case with our magnetic fields. And the effect of magnetic fields is just to make this effect happens at higher energies because magnetic fields give you an additional uh, bending, right? Whether it's primary proton or the secondary charge secondary. So that sort of explains with our magnetic fields due to kinematics, we can see an enhancement, but it only cuts, it cuts off at this energy. With magnetic fields, we see additional enhancements, and these are provided by the additional uh, angles bending effect caused by the magnetic fields. Okay. So that was the takeaway from uh, uh, our studies. Okay. Now comparing to the observations. Okay. So we found magnetic fields, that's the green line. Our conclusion is basically the same as the uh, Italian paper. 
uh, turns out maybe low energies, okay? With a magnetic field, you can already hit the observation level. But after, even after we put in the PFFS, PFSS magnetic fields, okay? The boost, it's boosted. Now we understand it's boosted because of the angle uh, widening effect. But even if it's boosted, it's still not sufficient to uh, close to what we see at 100 G. Okay. So magnetic fields can work, but at least from this input magnetic field model, it's not sufficient to work. Okay. So something new, uh, whether it's not magnetic field related or some additional sources of magnetic fields may be needed uh, to explain this discrepancy. Okay. So, um, uh, so in our paper, we only look at gamma rays. Okay. So one of the things in their paper, okay, uh, so is that they also look at neutrinos produced. Okay. Um, but I will take this results with a grain of salt because all the predictions did not match uh, the gamma ray observations. Okay, so you should question whether you would believe these uh, neutrino predictions. But at least at around one TV, what they predict is very close to previous calculations with our magnetic views. So these gray lines. Okay, so their prediction is very close to the uh, gray lines. Okay, um, but nobody's. Uh, uh, I would take these predictions with grain of salt. So nobody knows yet what would happen for neutrinos at these energies yet, uh, because uh, there's no calculations that actually matches the gamma ray observation. All right, so that's, so that's the summary okay. um, uh, on the current status of solar gamma rays and neutrinos. So solar gamma rays turns out to be very, very complicated, but in the near future, uh, we should expect some results from Hawk. Uh, maybe also Lasso after it's completed. Okay. Um, I know that there would be a result from the OSU group uh, using uh, more than 12 years of Fermi data very soon. Okay. Uh, and we are also trying to do more simulation studies, okay? put in more things that we think are relevant. Okay. In terms of neutrinos, okay, Ice Cube haven't uh, been able to uh, uh, be very sensitive to the benchmark predictions, but the benchmark predictions are not really trustworthy yet, unfortunately. So KM free net may uh, KM free net in some sense are better than Ice Cube, okay, uh, in some aspects. So maybe KM free net could be very useful. Uh, we don't know yet. Okay, and the solar atmospheric neutrino prediction with magnetic fields, okay, it's one of the things that we want to get in the future. All right, so that summarizes um, today's talk. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Kenny. Do we have any question for Kenny? Well, I'll ask one to get people started. So uh, I was wondering when you were showing your, your initial plots of the variation of the gamma rays uh, as a function of, of the year. Uh, if uh, there is a correlation also in the in the neutrinos. So, I mean, we have 20 plus years of data from, from super K and it's in principle sensitive all the way from MEV to a few hundred GeV. Um, and, and there is, a, as far as I know, the, there is a minimum and maximum uh, solar difference in the neutrino spectrum, but is that observed? I mean, expected, but is that observed? Right. So um, the relevant neutrinos uh, in this context, right, it's about uh, 10 GeV, right? It's sorry, about 10, uh, 1 to 10 TV, right? So um, in terms of the gamma rays, what we see at 100 GeV is that it's extremely sensitive to the activity of the sun. Okay? So the flux was boosted significantly. Uh, uh, when the sun was quiet at the highest energy, okay? Um, will this reflect into the neutrinos? Uh, it's actually not entirely clear because neutrinos can pass through the sun, okay? At least when this, uh, most of the sun, okay? So, but about one third of the sun, uh, neutrinos become so paid for these energies, okay? So that's why I say it, okay? It's not entirely sure what we expect of neutrinos at these energies, 
okay? because we don't really share the effect of magnetic fields yet. Yeah. But I would not be surprised yeah. if there is some uh, time dependent effect for neutrinos. Yeah. No. Okay, uh, then let me ask a, a follow-up. Oh, I think Irene has a question. Yeah, I have one more question. So in the in the in the simulations that you were showing towards the end, you mentioned that, that uh, probably if we uh, consider like other extra magnetic fields or other models for the magnetic fields, that these might be able to push the flux that you predict uh, up to upwards. And I was wondering, I mean, are uh, there some models that actually can then lead to, to such a large uh, flux that then you can probe? Because it seems like you need uh, about one order of magnitude. And yeah, I, I was just wondering if there are magnetic fields models for the sun that can allow such a boost. Do you know? Any? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that is uh, one of the things that I'm actually working on. Uh, there are several places that we can look at. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing, one of these places is, uh, for example, sunspots. Okay. So sunspots are known areas, sort of semi-large, okay, with very strong magnetic fields. Okay. Um, but okay, uh, one of the things that um, I did not mention is that if you look at these two predictions, okay, the magnetic, sorry, the predictions from when the sun was active is higher than the calculation when the sun was quiet. Okay. Uh, this makes sense if in this context because we need magnetic fields to enhance the gamma ray production. Okay. Uh, so you say, yes, we need places with stronger magnetic fields to enhance this gamma ray production. Right? Uh, but that's opposite from the gamma ray observation. The gamma ray observation is higher when the sun was less active. So yeah, as I mentioned, so I just told you that, okay, maybe sunspots can do it. So that's one of the places that we want to do. But we also know that sunspot, it's most uh, prominent when uh, the sun was active. And that's when we see less gamma rays, okay? So that sort of immediately uh, make this idea less attractive, okay? Uh, so one of the things we are working on is to talk to more solar physicists and try to bring pick them to give us more ideas. Okay. I know. Also, the sunspots would induce some periodicity in the signal. Uh, induce something, somewhat? And periodicity, I mean, they don't, they are not always in the same location. Yeah, yeah. But because we cannot really, um, the sun also rotates, right? So sunspot moves, okay, uh, at least 20, uh, uh, one cycle every 27 days. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really, gives at one at one particular spot, right? But it will yeah. move sort of horizontally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So so related related to that, uh, have you tried doing uh, something the reverse maybe using the data just to find out how big the magnetic field should be? Ah, that's for so that's uh, I have not uh, done that. Yeah, but maybe that's a very um, yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion. But to do that, we also need to, right, because these predictions come from magnetic fields, right? So to do that, that means we already need some simulations with stronger magnetic fields, right? Uh, that in some sense already requires a model and we don't really know the responsible magnetic fields, how it looks like, right? whether it's dominantly vertical or dominantly horizontal, right? Is it evenly distributed or if it's uh, localized. Right. So yeah, I guess it's not, not sort of yeah. make this problem more difficult, yeah. yeah. It's not just the magnetic field strength, it's the configuration of the field. Yeah, okay, right. more yeah. complicated than that, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we have time for, for one final question. So, so I'm still thinking about uh, this, uh, this uh, access here. If you, for example, add some dark annihilation in this same region, would you be able to match the observed flux? It's difficult because you, you see this access is time dependent, right? If it's dark matter related, uh, it's not clear how it can uh, induce this time dependence. Yeah. Unless it's something like an axion type model, which actually 
uh, it's sensitive to the magnetic fields, right? So mm -hmm. the sun's average magnetic field does change between solar minimum and solar maximum. Okay, so that was one of the things I was trying to uh, do, but I haven't been able to make it work yet. Right? Some kind of axial models that actually uh, uh, its flux is enhanced when there's stronger magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And Kenny, you said that these these uh, authors were using Fluca, so it's all the production channels are taking into account. So it's not right. just yeah. ions. So it's it's also higher resonances that could, in principle, boost the signal at higher energies. And right. that is so, not even uh, that is enough. Yeah, yeah. So in principle, Fluca should increase everything, right? Including shower developments, all kinds of secondary productions. Now, I forgot to mention, uh, we use Strayon. Yeah. Okay, I didn't mention here. So we use Strayon, so it's a different uh, particle generators, uh, but our solar minimum result sort of agrees. So that makes, uh, that should inset the calculations are somewhat trustworthy. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Our, sorry, our no magnetic field results mostly agrees. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see any, any hands. So uh, thank you, Kenny, for a super interesting talk. I find it like really interesting that we don't know how the sun works at high energy. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, everybody, thank you for being here. And uh, remember, uh, the next one will be in January 18th. So thanks again, and i uh, talk to you soon, Kenny, hopefully. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, you. too. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.